Voters stratify in one of four ways. There's believers. There's people who, who love the library. They have a relationship with the library, or they used to in their youth or childhood. There's only about 25% of the American public that are like that, though. The rest of the public stratifies out as either questioners or suspicious voters or never going to vote for you, never. About the never going to vote for you, never is about 22% to 25% as well. Uh, it's people who uh, don't believe in government. They don't believe in the common good. They don't believe in taxes. And that's a real movement in the states. And some of these book bans and censorship folks live in that space as well these days. And then the other two groups of voters are people who are questioners, and they have legitimate questions. So what's going on at the library these days? I haven't been there since I was a kid. And they want to hear the answers. They want to hear how the library of their youth is still doing good work. But then we've got suspicious voters who are very suspicious of government. And we see it in all across the West. In, in the U.S., it manifests in different ways. But Canada has its own version of it. The U.K., Brexit, I mean, my goodness, the EU countries. The, the whole framework around suspicion about government uh, really requires us as a pro-library organization, as supporters of libraries, to not only describe the good things that would happen, Mark, if, if we get the funding, if we, if we can do the work, but what happens if we don't? The suspicious voter says, tell me the truth about what happens if we don't spend some more tax money. Tell me what happens if we close the doors. And they're still willing to listen because they care enough about their community, they care enough about the the students, they care enough about, they're civically involved, they would just like to, just tell me the truth this time. What's going to happen if we don't is a major driver for our communications here as a political action committee and a think tank for libraries. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 347 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with John Kraska, the executive director of Every Library, the first nationwide political action committee for libraries, and the Every Library Institute, a nonprofit research and training organization focused on the future of library funding. In 2014, John was named a mover and shaker by Library Journal for his work with Every Library. He was also recognized by the Chicago Tribune in 2022 as a Chicagoian, did I pronounce that right? A Chicagoian of the year and by Publishers Weekly in 2023 as a notable for his work opposing book bans and censorship. And in the interview, John and I talk about every library, the great advocacy support work that they do, and the path that he took that led him to where he is today. It's a fantastic and very important interview, and that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by an author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores. Any author can get their book listed in an online catalog, but what if you want more? What if you want to rise above the digital masses and be relevant to booksellers and librarians? This book can help with attracting the attention of the curators of those sales channels, succeeding and getting some of those channels to highlight, spotlight, and promote your books to their customer patrons. Having a bookstore or library actually order and stock your print book. Being invited to either host or participate in a live event in a bookstore or library. And standing out as a talented and relevant professional or subject matter expert. An author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores is available online everywhere in ebook and print formats. You can ask for it at your local library or bookstore. You can also get the ebook at a discounted price via the Smashwords store. 
And there will be a universal book link to this book at all retailers, including a link to the Smashwords store, where in February and March of 2024, you can get it at a special reduced price. Again, this is an author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores by me, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and available through Stark Publishing. And now for comments from recent episodes. Over on the Twitter sphere, now known as X, Edwin Downward says, and this is for episode 345, The Art of Libromancy with Josh Cook. Edwin says, I'm now thinking about how us indie authors need to think more about how bookstore owners treat their customers. Our mainly digital existence puts us at a disadvantage due to the limits on how we can interact with readers. Thanks so much for that comment, Edwin. You're so correct. There are so many wonderful advantages to the digital existence and how we can connect directly with customers, but there's nothing like an in-person experience. For example, when I was at Superstars Writing Seminars last week, and this would have been the week of February 5th through the 9th, 2024, on the Wednesday evening, we had a gigantic book signing event, and uh, there was an indie bookseller there, Laura Hayden, and she was a guest on previous episodes. I'll have links to that in the show notes here at starkreflections.ca, but she was the bookseller there. She had ordered my books in from Ingram and had them available in stock, and those books were available uh, or other authors had books available that they could bring in on consignment or that Laura ordered through the publisher. And, you know, that would be, you know, major New York Times bestselling authors and she was bringing the books in. Now, interestingly enough, this is a perfect example of having a great relationship with a bookseller. Because most booksellers are very unlikely to order stock of a non-returnable print-on-demand title. However... I've known Laura for years. I have a history of working with Laura for years, and I have an agreement with her that if she orders them in from Ingram rather than me having to truck them from Canada to the U.S., et cetera, and do the whole consignment thing, filling up, I already buy enough books and bring them back, so I have an extra bag just for books that I purchase, and I did, did buy quite a number this year. But Laura and I have an agreement where she orders them in from Ingram, and then, uh, so she's not stuck with stock, I purchase stock from her or because I've been to numerous events that she's been at uh, occasionally she'll just continue to carry that stock that she brought in from me but that's only because I have a close relationship with her and I've constantly supported that bookstore so supporting your local bookstore supporting your local library are critical having those intimate in-depth relationships with them is something that authors can do, but it takes a lot of work. It's not clickety-click, barber trick, here's an algorithm that you're going to game on Amazon. No, 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 this, this is about relationships, and that's an important aspect. But in any case, I've just noticed the soapbox that I'm standing on. I'm going to step down off this soapbox, and I'm going to say thank you, Edwin, so much for the comments. And I remember Edwin, uh, yourself, and I think it was Don King earlier for uh, a previous episode where, where I, I ranted about how much I love libraries, and you guys shared your own personal experiences about your libraries. And I am going to, uh, I, I do want to do a special episode uh, with folks sharing their own first experiences or, or, or you know, deepest, longest memories of their childhood libraries or bookstores. I think that would be a marvelous episode. And that's it for the comments uh, from recent episodes. If you want to leave a comment, I love to hear your comments, love to hear what you're thinking on, what you're reflecting on as you listen to the podcast. You can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca. You can leave comments over at the Patreon page. You can leave comments over where it posts to YouTube, etc., etc. Or you can email me, mark at marklesley.ca. And now for a personal update. I, as I mentioned in my soapbox rant in the previous segment, I was in Colorado Springs at Superstars Writing Seminars. I realized my very first one that I went to was 2012. So with the exception of a couple of those pandemic years where I wasn't going there, I was going there every single year since 2012. But I think it was my 10th or 11th time. 
at Superstars. I'm now uh, a, a member of the faculty. I've been a, a recurring member of uh, speaker at the event from the beginning. And in the last few years, I've taken over as the MC. And, and I'm honored that I get to introduce uh, the incredible event and be a part of such an incredible experience. And I'm still riding a high. So this is the 15th of February. And, and the conference ended on the 10th. Uh, Saturday the 10th was the last day. So it's five days later. And I'm still riding this incredible high of spending a week with so many incredible people. So many phenomenal people. There, there were close to 400 people at this conference. And it has been, for the longest time, my favorite conference of the year where I get to connect with so many incredibly amazing people. And, and when I started, I think there was maybe, what, 50, 75 people? And now it's just under 400. But it still has this incredible feeling like I am spending the week with 400 of my best friends who get me, who see me, who understand me, and it's so funny because I was talking to folks like Michael Aron, who was a guest speaker last year and came back this year and is coming back in 2025. <laughs> and I jokingly said, you're drinking our Kool-Aid now, aren't you? Because he loves it and he loves the experience that he has there. And it's so funny because it almost feels like jokingly like a cult. And we talk about tribe, we talk about family, we talk about having each other's backs and propping one another up. And a lot of that comes from the several of the of the, the things that James Artemis Owen does. James does this amazing drawing out the dragons talks and also has an eggs benedict breakfast where he shares lessons with writers. But there's something really valuable as I mentioned before about authors feeling like they finally found their people, that they finally found people who see them who get them, who understand them. We can be odd creatures, us creative people, us writers. And we live and breathe the writing life in so many different ways and in, and in so many different ways in our regular lives, in our normal lives. There are many people, as much as they love us, family and friends, who may not really get it, who may not understand just how passionate, how deeply engaged we are in our writing and what that means to us. But those other writers, they get it. They understand us. And I was talking to my partner Liz about this the other night when I was experiencing, like I was just trying to express just how, how it, it seems to have been ramped up. It seems to have been significantly power charged and, and how high the emotions were. And how much I love these people. Just how incredibly powerful I feel to be part of a community that, that can support one another. And there were so many different examples that I witnessed of authors propping other authors up and supporting them and, and helping them and, and seeing that somebody needed something and providing it for them. That inspires me in so many ways. And, and and Liz was mentioning that it's interesting because you get all these creative people, you bring them all together, you open things up, and in many ways, a lot of us are a lot more vulnerable, but we expose that vulnerability openly to one another. Like, remove those defenses, those barriers we often put up in regular society. And it's almost like a, a fantastical fantasy realm. I even joked I was standing in the hallway at one point during the conference. I was, I, was, I was waiting for someone to come down this long hallway towards one of the main halls. And as I was standing in, in the hallway after lunch one day, the lunch break, and I was waiting to talk to somebody. So I was just sort of standing down this long hallway as people were coming back from lunch. And as people were coming by, I, I, I started to do the old, 
flight attendant, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, hello, welcome, goodbye, that kind of thing. And and then I broke into, welcome to Fantasy Island, or welcome back to Fantasy Island. If, if you're not old enough to get that, I'll leave a link in the show notes to this old television program. But it really was, in many ways, and I'm not making light of, of Superstars as being a Fantasy Island, but it really is a Fantasy Island for writers where, you know, dreams come true. And some of the dreams coming true are are that you, you get to spend, you know, three, four days in this intense environment where it's all about writing. And I can be with such amazing creative people and learn from them. I can sit beside New York Times bestselling authors. I can have in-depth conversations at, at BarCon in the evening with an editor or an agent from various agencies or publishing houses that are there. I can talk to other writers in person in an intimate way that I just can't, despite the amazingness of the technology that we have with all the various video chats, etc. I mean, there's nothing like breaking bread uh, with a fellow author and having these conversations or, you know, having a drink sitting across from them or even engaging in a really great panel, listening to a bunch of people talking or or even being on the panel and, and, and just, I mean, the notes I took from the panels I was on, from, from the par- other participants and the things that I learned, just so incredible. So I will have a link, of course, to Superstars Writing Seminars. I'll probably continue to gush about it in episodes to come, but I really felt like this was the best one yet. It was so powerful, so incredible. And this isn't just me post-pandemic speaking of it's the first conference I've been back to. Because I've been to oh, about 10 different in-person events, at least, maybe a dozen since the pandemic, well, the pandemic is not officially really over because a whole whack of people came down with COVID who were at this uh, conference last week, including a lot of people I spent a lot of time with. And I just tested about an hour ago. Again, I've tested uh, half a dozen times since I've come back just to be safe. I've isolated. I do not want to get Liz sick. She's in the middle of a major transition uh, at work from one school to another. The last thing she needs is to have to isolate when uh, the kids need her and the teachers and the whole rest of the learning team needs her. So I've been isolating, uh, which is kind of frustrating and sad because I really miss, you know, spending time with her and eating with her and stuff like that. And I've been eating separately and, and just keeping a mask on and keeping my distance from her, like talking to her from across the room, which is just not the same as, you know, sitting across from her at the dinner table and having an end of day conversation about how our days went. So I really miss that. But for her safety, just in case I am contagious, I probably have at least another day or two of testing just to make sure that I'm clear. It'd be a full week since I would have been in contact with uh, folks uh, from the conference who um, you know came down with COVID. And uh, but knock on wood, and I am actually knocking on wood by the way. Knock on wood, um, I'm I'm clear and and. And that would be great. But in any case, I'll, I'll probably continue to rant and rave about how amazing Superstars is. But speaking of ranting and raving of just how amazing libraries are and why they're so important, why they are so critical to the community, after this bumper, you're going to hear my interview with John Kraska from Every Library. Hey, John, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Mark, it is great to be on the show. Thank you. I am so thrilled to have you on the show. Well, you are the executive director of Every Library, but before we start talking about Every Library and Every Library and different (laughs) aspects of that, what's your background? How did you get into this realm? Sure, I'm not a librarian, uh, even though we are called Every Library. The idea is that any library ballot measure, any library funding opportunity, and these days, any challenge to libraries anywhere should matter to every library everywhere. But I'm not a librarian. I uh, started off my career in publishing, but uh, through the bookseller route, 
and I did that for a couple of years in a small neighborhood bookstore in suburban Chicago. Uh, I got recruited to be a sales rep for a publishing company. Okay. Uh, this was before the internet, really. Right. And then at one point, I got really tired of being a sales rep. And I, I was on the road five days a week, seeing a lot of the country, but uh, I switched over into that ed tech space as the internet came around. Right. And education technology became the core of my work until a certain point when the whole you know, internet.com bubble blew up. And so I, I went to work actually for the American Library Association. Okay. At that point, my wife was going through uh, a, a grad school. We needed some insurance. I wanted something that was mission driven and libraries really lined up. So the chance to be able to do uh, something in the world in that space, helping librarians do their jobs better, helping these institutions, these schools. And then uh, after a couple of years, you know, kids, mortgage, that, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Um, had a little pivot into association management, but then got tired of doing association management work and decided to come back in the, in the library space. At that point, I'd been on the board of trustees for my local library here in suburban Chicago, been on a, a couple state initiatives and some, some other library infrastructure. I'd really come to appreciate the industry and like librarians. Um, and so setting up this political action committee, setting up a think tank, a public policy think tank, was where I wanted to put my talents and my time to work. Uh, it's been very rewarding. We're celebrating our 12th anniversary in 2024. Oh, my God. Congratulations. That is uh, fantastic. So yeah. uh, I have to act because I have a very similar uh, starting to my, my background, starting working in the neighborhood bookstore right out yeah. of college. Uh, is that bookstore still around? No, it was a family bookstore, not my family, but uh, the couple that owned it. Had been at it for 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. They retired in the in the mid 1990s. Uh, they wow. sold it. Unfortunately, the folks that they sold it to, the market conditions at that point, I know Crown Books and you know the rise of the internet, and yeah. unfortunately they didn't make it through. Um, and yeah, that was that, a tough time, and and it and, and it was a recession. Uh, it was a lot going on, right? So yeah, yeah the indie bookstore of my youth is a, an indie bookstore that I'd love to see come back, and we're starting to see it around Chicago. I don't know about your neck of the woods. Uh, but that period there from about 1998 to about 2008, 2010, yeah. what a difficult time for, for, for the culture of reading. It was, it was tough. I was, I was president of the Canadian Booksellers Association towards Very the cool. end of that era. And it was not easy for a lot of independent bookstores, but it's yeah, so, cool. it's so invigorating to see, to see the resurgence uh, in the last even five years. Yeah. The, the specialty, so that store happened to be a specialty store. It was religion, philosophy, and ethics. Okay. Um, and it also did uh, just secular trade. It was a Logos bookstore. And there, there was, used to be a whole bunch of them around the country. You know, we would go to CBA uh, for the Christian Booksellers Association. We'd go to AARSBL for the, the uh, uh, Academy of Religion Society of Biblical Literature. we go to, to, to uh, ABA back when there was an ABA. Yeah. You know? yeah. And once in a while, I'd bounce across uh, Toronto for something fun or Frankfurt. <laughs> well, there was a CBA back in the day, too. But that That's right. Way before the ABA <laughs> so, or BEA, sorry, not uh, BEA. BEA. Oh yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, back in the back in the day, let's call it that. We'll back call it the in those days, yeah, of course. All right, so let's. So every library. So mm -hmm. what what is it then? Essentially, just uh, so people can understand, is it a platform? It's a it's a a movement. What is this? You, you, so we have uh, some very practical things that we do, like on the on on, on uh, the every library side. We're a political action committee for libraries. Uh, technically, it's a it's a 501c4 organization within the IRS code. Uh, technically, you know that means that we can do things that are political. Socially, you, you've heard about super PACs, Mark. I'm sure you know the, the ability to raise and expend unlimited funds to advance your nefarious special interests. Yeah, <laughs> we're that kind of an organization for libraries. Okay. Um, libraries are our nefarious special interests. <laughs> um, and, but we don't have unlimited funds. Uh, so we do work uh, as a network rather than a membership organization. Uh, we've got a, a network of uh, donors, of activists, people who who care about libraries um, and librarians. It's right. about 330,000 people strong right now. Our mailing list wow. is not insignificant, though we're on our way to getting a million Americans for libraries. Wow. I mean, I'd love to see three million Americans for libraries. It's where you can bring real political power to these issues. And then on our nonprofit side, which is your traditional, for those of you who are keeping score, the traditional 501c3 nonprofit, uh, a lot of associations are set up like that, a lot of charities. We're set up as a think tank on the Ever Library Institute side. We do public policy, tax policy, education policy, but we also try and educate the American public. So 
our 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 mailing list is about three hundred thirty thousand people. Our social media reach is in in the half a million range, um, and so we try and tell stories about libraries as solutions to problems for for people. Librarians as enactors of those solutions. Okay, and 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 in in that in your role, um, there are various sort of uh, keynote speeches, articles you've delivered, such as one I think that was called the Accidental Candidate. Uh, yeah. updating voter nostalgia around libraries and libraries on the campaign trail. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Because it's kind of fascinating. It's like, it feels like, oh, there's nothing we can do, but there's so much, right? There is. Uh, so right now, the American public uh, looks at libraries on election days in, in a particular way. In, in about 37 states, libraries actually have to go to election days to, to get their funding, public libraries, to get their funding secured. Um, it might be a bond to build a new building. It might be an operating referendum, a right. tax levy, a parcel tax. And voters stratify in one of four ways. There's there's believers. There's people who, who love the library. They have a relationship with the library or they used to in their youth or childhood. Right. There's only about 25 percent of the American public that are like that, though. The rest of the public stratifies out as either questioners or suspicious voters okay. or never going to vote for you, never. About the never going to vote for you never is about 22% to 25% as well. Uh, it's people who uh, don't believe in government. They don't believe in the common good. They don't believe in taxes. And that's a real movement in the states. I mean, we're, we're talking about the recession of 20, you know, 2010, the Great Recession, the Tea Party, and those anti-tax groups. And some of these book bans and censorship folks live in that space as well these days. Right. Um, and then the other two groups of voters are people who are questioners. And they have legitimate questions. So what's going on at the library these days? I haven't been there since I was a kid. And they want to hear the answers. They want to hear how the library of their youth is still doing good work. Right, right. But then we've got suspicious voters who are very suspicious of government. And we see it in, in all across the West. In, in the U.S., it manifests in different ways. But Canada has its own version of it. The U.K., Brexit, I mean, my goodness, the EU countries. The, the whole framework around suspicion about government uh, really requires us as a, a pro-library organization, as, as supporters of libraries, to not only describe the good things that would happen, Mark, if if we get the funding, if we if we can do the work, but what happens if we don't? Right, the, right. The suspicious right. voter says, "Tell me the truth about what happens if we don't spend some more tax money. What? Tell me what happens if 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 yeah. we close the doors, and they're still willing to listen." Because they care enough about their community, they care enough about the, the students, they care enough about, they're civically involved, they would just like to, just tell me the truth this time. What's going to happen if we don't right. is a major driver for our communications here as a political action committee and a think tank for libraries. Wow. Okay. So, so let's let's talk about the the, the library in modern society, particularly yeah. in, a, in an environment that's you know digital. Mm -hmm. a, a perfect example is... Well, you know, during uh, March 2020, I couldn't go to a bookstore. I couldn't go to the local library. Right. And, and I remember my local library. I mean, I had an app. I had a Levy app on my phone. I had a Hoopla app for because I have multiple library cards. Different Absolutely. You should. Yeah. And, and I was able to get, I could get the, I ironically get the digital file without a virus because we didn't know uh, if, if things were, you know, <laughs> washing things off or staging Absolutely. products before we brought them into the house. So, so in this in this modern realm, I, I imagine the suspicious people would say, "Well, what what really does the library do for for me? I don't I don't I don't do books." Mm -hmm. So there's there's two things. One is that during the pandemic, the share of reading that was sourced from the library uh, grew from nineteen percent to twenty four percent, and that's a very significant bit of growth in a very short amount of time. And the nice thing to report to to uh, the publishing community uh, to the reading community is that that's holding. Uh, libraries are, no, are to like twenty twenty four. Yeah, twenty twenty four. Oh, okay. So we've been working on a project uh, to support a project called the Freckle Survey and the Freckle Report. Uh, the question that uh, Tim Coates, who runs the Freckle Report, keeps asking Americans is, "Where did you get that book?" And like I said, in twenty twenty four, twenty four percent, nearly a quarter of all reading is sourced from a library, and that's a big deal. So when you look at a percentage of that being digital, uh, we also know from things like the Book Industry Study Group and other questions about consumer behavior and analysis of uh, book buying and book reading and book uptake, there's a percentage 
Last time I looked, it was under 13% that are digital only. There's only about 55% of the American public who are book only still, but there's a lot of folks who are hybrid in that middle space. Right. And that percentage of, of, of that mix, we should spend a lot of attention on. And for the folks who don't read, I mean, my goodness, 90% of, of Americans in that, in that survey report having some use of a book. I think that we need to start to talk less about the nobility of what libraries do all the time. And they do noble things. You know, they help people. You know, they transform lives. They build communities, all that kind of good stuff. But sometimes it's just cool to let people have permission to just to, just to hang out and read, you know? Yeah. So when we talk to those suspicious people who say, what's in it for me? Yes, there's some noble things that society gets out of a library, but fundamentally it's like, well, do you, do you have your own personal library? Congratulations. But let's talk about those people who don't. Let's talk about what it means to have access to reading, not just literature, not just the noble stuff, but like, like it's nice. I mean, it's fun. The culture of reading is just, it's satisfying. It's a, it's part of the human condition. Right, right. Well, and, yeah. and there's been studies that, that lead to a correlation between reading and empathy. Yes, yes. The, the empathy curve, the isolation issues that are going on in our society right now that come from, a, a, I mean, the pandemic hasn't ended for a lot of people. The, the changes and disruptions to, to comfort, you know, do I feel comfortable going out of my house? I mean, look at the changes to banking, look at the changes to grocery stores, look at the changes to libraries. I mean, curbside is, is a factor and digital certainly is. Yeah. You know, the, the, the isolation of society, obviating those those social isolations is is not just a, a literacy issue or a self satisfaction issue. It's a public health issue. Wow, wow, this is so fascinating. So let's let's get into one of the one of the hot topics that's been very very uh, unfortunately um, proliferating throughout mm -hmm. American society is book bans and censorship and stuff like that. And and I guess every library's role in in that world. So every library is a political action committee. We've been operating, like I said, for about 12 years now. We get started at the end of 2012 doing library election days, which were opportunity campaigns, as far as I'm concerned. Right. You know, the idea that we're going to go out and try and build a new building, great. That's a wonderful opportunity. Let's let's try and have, have it happen. Um, over the years, we've done negotiations and lobbying activity with city councils, county government, state legislators. We've done a lot of work on school librarians over the years. Again, opportunity campaigns. And then it started to turn. You know, it started to turn into crisis campaigns because yeah. the censorship and the book bans were coming after uh, not just a particular title over a legitimate concern or a deeply held belief, but they started coming after the, the library, uh, the public library as a unit of government. They started coming after the school libraries, uh, both as part of public education as well as the public sector workforce. And they started to, to remember something that's very pernicious in our society, which is that it's easier to censor a book than it is to attack a person or a population. So these campaigns of, of around book bans are often anti-LGBTQ. They're often anti-black and brown. There, there's, a, there's a form of discrimination in labeling a book as being offensive, uh, a book as being obscene. So there truly are uh, discriminatory forces out there that have, like in history, repeating itself, identified again that it is much easier to go after a book and label that book and there, thereby, I mean, if you say a book is criminal because it has a story about a, a gay couple who have kids, you know, if that's criminalized, then that gay couple and their family and everybody else in that space is, by extension, labeled as a criminal. I mean, my goodness, Mark, this, these are not just the freedom of speech issues as far as we're concerned here at Every Library. This is fundamentally about a, a human rights, civil rights framework as well. Yeah, yeah, again, and, and, and not to mention, and never mind, like even the, the overreaching labeling as criminal or a, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a parent uh, or, or, or anything like that, but even just the representation of, I, I remember, you know, seeing videos of young girls uh, seeing like Little Mermaid uh, commercials, for example, the, the, the revised uh, live mm -hmm. action Little Mermaid, mm -hmm. and just saying, oh, my God, she looks like me, yes. which is something that, you know, as a fully privileged, you know, cis gender, uh, yeah. heterosexual, middle-aged white guy. Mm -hmm. I have all the privileges. I've always seen myself in in media, but not everyone has ha had that luxury, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, so, you know, we live in a 
uh, society that's post-interracial marriage. Thank goodness. It's post-gay marriage. Thank goodness. It's post, uh, there, there's a, a Supreme Court case in 2020 that is called the Bostock case, which allows for transgender individuals to have their, their full gender expression in their workplace. I mean, this is an anti-discrimination uh, uh, case that's foundational. We're, we're in a post-Bostock society. Uh, anti-discrimination has been a core component of public libraries uh, since the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, mm -hmm. we tend to talk about the First Amendment of 1787 a lot, and the First Amendment guarantees the right to read. It guarantees the right to publish. Uh, it guarantees the, those free expression issues. But the First Amendment's limited, and this is where book bans get really complicated. It's limited by the fact that uh, you cannot, as a, as a unit of government, impose speech, but also the public library, the school library, cannot host something that's illegal, which is what obscenity is. Obscenity is an illegal thing. It's harmful. And so the government has, and the courts over the years, have put curbs on obscenity, which is why when somebody wants to ban a book for pernicious reasons, for political reasons, they're using that terminology of obscene, not just to, about the book, but about those populations, which is why coming back around to anti-discrimination and civil rights is so important because uh, the First Amendment basically says if it's not obscene, you can keep it in the library. It, it's, a, it's about retaining the title uh, as opposed to bringing it in in the first place. Okay. But why do you bring the book in the library in the first place? Why do you do a program about representation what, why do you have a meeting room that's available to people? It's part of the, the public accommodation framework and, and the anti-discrimination framework that's inherent in American civil rights law. If we're not going to turn somebody away at the library door because of the color of their skin or because they're wearing a rainbow flag pin, why are we taking their books off the shelf? And we're trying to have a broader conversation in this country right now here at every library about not just the First Amendment as the only principle about rights, I mean, First Amendment's great, but what about the Fourteenth Amendment? What about equal protection? Right. Wow. And 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 you've reminded me of something that's really important. A, a lot of us think about some of our passion for the library was well, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. If we mm -hmm. wanted to have access to read, the library was a safe haven. We could go. We could experience the the universe through printed books. Mm -hmm. But I've recognized in my own community here in Waterloo, Ontario. The library is so much more than, and, and I am a book nerd and book lover through and through, but it's not just about books. Yes, it's a great place. You can go and have access to magazines and books and all kinds of, even the apps that you have access to, to be able mm -hmm. to read stuff that you could never afford to, to purchase. But then you have access to, to, to printers. You have access to studios where you could, if you wanted to record a podcast, there's a studio you can you know borrow rent for a time, but free. Uh, right. From the library, uh, our local library here in in one of the neighborhoods in, in Waterloo, you you could borrow skates in the winter, which can be very expensive. So it, yes. there's all kinds of access and equal opportunity for the entire community. Mm -hmm. That's not, I mean, and but reading is obviously a central part of that for people like me. But mm -hmm. there may be people that, well, I don't, I can't afford skates, but I'd love to go skating. Well, the library's got a solution for you, or I want to, I want to be able to record something. I don't have the equipment or the computer technology. You know, Mark, I think that you know, the Canadian example and the U.S. example are cheek by jowl. You know, how do, how do local councils want to put a small amount of smart tax money to work? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and a provincial scheme, a uh, state scheme, you know, a tax scheme. Like, how do we want to uh, make available elements that are there for enjoyment, for edification, for, for learning? The creative economy benefits from from public library services like you're describing. The the I mean, my goodness, there there are people just from an economic perspective. Like, let's boil it all down for like white guys like ourselves. You know, like the creative economy benefits because the library has all that stuff, and somebody can move from being a hobbyist to being an entrepreneur. You know, yeah. like let's let's get away from from literacy and little kids for a minute. There's something very practical about that, and also there's something very progressive about it. I don't want to own everything I need because if I did, I'd have to have two houses. Yes. So why don't we warehouse some of the stuff that we need, like you're describing? Also, some stuff is just there to uh, be discovered. You know, there's a lot of emerging technologies that I can't afford to buy, 
you know, personally. Right. And yet I'd love to get my hands on it. So how about we all do it together? I think that there's something very much about the social compact here, very much about how, how Western society uh, is intending to lower barriers to individual and family success. I, I like that, that. That's what attracts me to it. I mean, I got to be honest with you, Mark, I'm looking at your at your podcast listeners. Mark's got a lot of books in his background. OK, <laughs> I'm not a huge reader. My, my wife has the pile of books by our bedside. It's going to fall over and kill us some night. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I come at this from like a systems perspective. How do we get folks access to that good stuff in a place that's got the built environment and it's got staff that's paying attention? That's why I'm in this to begin with. That is, that is uh, fantastic. So, so anyone who's listening to this and, and like me is really excited and really impassioned and says, yes, how can I help? What can I do? <laughs> What can I, this sounds amazing. We need more of it. What can people do who want to get involved and want to support every library and all the great things you're doing? Well, you're very sweet to, to, to offer that. We are a movement organization. We're a network. Everylibrary.org uh, is the place to start. Uh, if you want to find out more about these policy issues, these, these um, political opportunities, if you're very concerned here in the States about the First Amendment issues and the right to read and the civil rights issues, I would highly recommend spending some time on our fightforthefirst.org site. Okay. Fight for the First is all about community organizing, grassroots activity. Uh, we have set up basically a change.org you know, for libraries over there where you can make your voice heard in defense of these rights and, and the right to read, the rights of stories to be told. We spend a lot of time on social media at every library and want to help people find uh, easy pathways uh, to participate in their local democracy through the library. And on the school side in particular uh, as well, Mark, we're, we're really looking to move people from aware to active, and we have a lot of pathways available for people to do that. Oh, my God. So so how about a foreigner like myself? I mean, obviously, a lot of policy and things that happen in the States affect us, right. little people up north of the 49th parallel. Are there ways that you know a foreigner like myself can get involved and help? Well, you know what? I really appreciate you in, in the Canadian colleagues that are listening to this to spend a little bit more time with the Canadian Library Federation and the Ontario uh, Library Federation, or sorry, Library Association in particular, the Canadian Urban Libraries Council. Canadian Urban Libraries Council, Ontario Library Association, the Canadian Library Federation are all doing um, wonderful work on big issues. Um, the big issues of what's the, the council uh, provincial federal framework around funding. Uh, they're working on big issues around uh, the right to read. You know, the, the Canadian Charter of, of Rights is very different than the U.S. Constitution when it comes to the human rights protections around access to, to information. And those organizations, our colleagues uh, in, in your neck of the woods, as it were, are doing the good work. Not that I'm not inviting participation on every library. We are really, I mentioned before about the IRS, you know, the Internal Revenue Services. I wouldn't cross the border for that if I were you. You know, the, the, <laughs> the work that we're doing as a political action committee, not that I don't invite uh, collaborators, but we're not necessarily, you know, you've got the right homegrown groups up there already. Right, right. So supporting them and making sure they're still continuing to be strong mm -hmm. It helps strengthen all of the people doing the same work, regardless of where they are, I imagine. That's right. That's right. It's because, so in the United States, we talk about the First Amendment, and the freedom of expression, the 14th Amendment, or equal protection, human rights. But we also talk about the 10th Amendment, which is how the federal government here uh, distributes the ability for states to make their own decisions, you know? Right. And it's a very U.S. kind of framework. The Canadian experience is in a similar way. It's particular and peculiar. And, and I mean that in the most respectful way possible, the word peculiar, but it, it is. I mean, it's just that we we tend to dominate your media cycle. My apologies. No, but that's OK. And and to be quite honest, even though I have regular listeners in over 30 countries, mm -hmm. the majority of my listeners are coming from the U.S. So I know this is going to benefit my my audience oh, sure. uh, in a sure. very good way. And then the rest of us who are outside of the U.S. can mm -hmm. probably find and I will include links to the, the various mm -hmm entities that, that you've mentioned in the show notes uh, for the website. Absolutely. And then, you know, you, your listeners in the UK, there's uh, Libraries Unlimited. There's, um, I mean, the, the, the EU 2030 initiative that's going on right now around libraries is extraordinary. I mean, th this is an ecosystem that extends into Australia. This is an ecosystem of people who believe in, in certain inalienables, you know, the, the right to read, the right to discover, 
the the opportunity to have free expression. I mean, it's it's part of a Western democracy approach, and we're here in a particular way in the states, but we will celebrate with our colleagues on across any border. Awesome, uh, and thank you for that. So, so just mm -hmm. as we get close to wrapping up, um, what's your vision for uh, the future of of libraries? So we we are focused on uh, the dignity of work in libraries, which is one of the reasons that we're spending so much time talking about librarians as enactors of these solutions for families, whether it's public libraries or school libraries. We want to see a situation where the librarians who are under attack right now in certain places for, for their defense of liberty and free expression are supported more effectively. And we want to make sure that there's a place uh, in the budget. You know, the, the local council budget, the, 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 the state's budget for state aid, even federally uh, for grants and aid for, the, for that work. Where do we want to see the institutions go is really focused on uh, making sure that there's library buildings that are there to accommodate a post-COVID society. You know, the, the changes that need to be made in order to, to help people find that new place that's outside of home. I mean, it used to be that I would go to my office you know, I would go to an, an office. I haven't left my house, Mark, and I don't know how long, you know, where I would like other people like myself to have that third place, which is now the second place uh, available to them through, through the library. So we look at it both as a, um, a workforce that's able to meet people where they're at and support them and where they want to go, as well as institutions and, and buildings that are there really to be that anchor in those communities and on those campuses. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, John, thank you so much. Can you remind people where they can find every library online? We are either ubiquitous or notorious at uh, everylibrary.org and uh, just at every library across social media markets. I'm looking forward to meeting more of your listeners out there. Awesome. And thank you so much for hanging out with me, John. What a pleasure today. There are a few things I want to reflect on based on this conversation. The first is it was so interesting when John got into the breakdown of the four different ways that voters stratify. And, and just a reminder, the believers, you know, the people who love the library or have a relationship with their library, and that's about 25%. And then on the other side, there's between 22 and 25% who are like, no, never. I would die first. <laughs> I'm never going to vote for this because I just hate everything about this. And that's about 20 to 25%. But more interestingly are the people in the middle. The questioners who just who have legitimate good questions and the suspicious votes. And I really like that. I want to focus on the suspicious votes. And this is the people who very legitimately and very reasonably question the value of a local library. Maybe because, well, they, they don't do books, right? So for them, they want to understand what happens if there's no library in their community. And it's a very reasonable discussion. Unlike the ridiculous, unreasonable, non-discussions that have been happening online, particularly elevated since the pandemic, as, as we got the keyboard warriors who are just out to for blood rather than listening and reasoning. But these are concerned, passionate individuals who really want to understand what's good for their communities. And they want to know what would happen if a library doesn't exist. And I think it's really important when I think about this. And again, I mentioned this in the interview, but it's so it's so important to return to. Is what the library means to me and how that library, local library, impacts me. I'm lucky. I'm privileged. I'm, I'm middle class. Uh, I'm white. I'm cisgender. I'm, I'm heterosexual, male. I have all the privilege you can imagine except... I'm follically challenged, so uh, I'm tall, but but I, I I have that I have that going for me. But so I have all of these benefits and all of these things. I've always had access to books in my home, and 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 not everyone has that. And it's so important for people to have access to information, so they can learn, they can read. It just it opens up the world to so many people. Now I've always had that in my home, but I still love the library. There are people many people who don't have access to the, those fundamental resources of reading. The library can be so much more. They can provide access to so many other things. People who don't have a computer can get access to a computer at the library or printers. 
or 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 studios so they can if they wanted to do their own podcast they didn't have to own the equipment they can go in and and and, and book time in the library to take care of those things they also as i mentioned you can rent skates from the local library there's so many different there's so many different tools and things that you don't necessarily need to own but that the library brings to the community it's also a safe haven where people can go and they can connect and you can have local group meetings and stuff like that without having to pay for the space just such an amazing opportunity but legitimately there are people who have concerns why am i paying for this why are my tax dollars going towards this and i think it's important that we recognize the value and 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 john obviously in every library recognizes all of this value that a library can offer the last thing i want to reflect on is the critical nature of censorship and and i never thought of it until john put it this way is that it's not merely a matter of freedom of speech it's a matter of human rights and and the nature by which book banning is is a way that that people can attack or criminalize very specific populations by calling them obscene and calling them criminal is breaks my heart because again i'm in a privileged group i don't have to worry that books about middle-aged white cisgendered males who are six foot three that books from writers like me are going to be banned that's not it's not even an issue but i think it's so important that we understand that there are so many people who are part of so many different communities whose very creative work, whose very creative expression is being forced out of libraries by malicious groups who seek to criminalize them and call them obscene. That work is so important that people like every library is doing so critical to help all of us to help all of us have access to and learn more about the world i grew up in mid-northern ontario a very very homogenous white wasp sort of community i didn't really have access to information and insights from other cultures by default i was kind of raised prejudiced and racist and i'm only at the age of 54, it, it's been a long, slow journey for me to become less racist. I can't say I'm not racist. I am in so many ways. But I'm working at it and I'm working really hard to learn. And part of that is being able to read books from people with different experiences, with different religious backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different orientation backgrounds, so I can better understand the richness of the diversity of life and libraries allow everyone to have access to that not just the people who can afford to purchase that material or or people who can travel and purchase travel i've i i don't i don't live where i grew up and so many people have never left the place they grew up they've never had exposure to other cultures it wasn't until i moved to ottawa that i actually in the neighborhood that I lived in in Ottawa, that I was a, a white minority. And that was a fantastic thing for me to experience that because I'd never, ever experienced that before until what the age of 18, 19 years old. But in any case, I, after this interview, I joined uh, the American Library Association. Uh, I'm, I'm planning on wanting to attend um, one of their conferences in San Diego, I think in the summer. But I also plan on joining local, like Canadian, Ontario library associations as well. You don't have to be a librarian necessarily to join some of these organizations. You can, you can join as a supporter. And I want to be more involved. I've been very heavily involved in the book industry since 1992. But I'd like to get more involved in the library uh, part of things. And so that's one of the things... One of the steps that I'm taking, I'm trying to get access to more books and, and support books by other communities and learn more, but I'm also wanting to see what I can do locally, uh, regionally, um, provincially, and uh, nationally. What can I do 
to strengthen those libraries that strengthen our communities. Well, that's the end of this very long <laughs> rant and reflection. Uh, thank you, John, for coming on the podcast and sharing insights about every library with me. I am, of course, always curious about your reflections, dear listener. But I do thank you for listening to the podcast. I thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave a comment on a podcast. Leave your own reflection of what you're thinking or what this conversation, this interview made you think about. You can also leave a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want, you can also become one of the patrons who supports this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections, where you get access to additional content, additional reflections, additional posts and content, and a huge shout out and thank you to my awesome patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash darkreflections. But again, you can support this podcast just by sharing it with someone that you think would find value in the content. So that's it for this episode. Thanks again for listening. Until next week and until next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. My dear guests, I am Mr. Raw, your host. Welcome to Fantasy Island.